Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Plan B Success. We have Sela Ward with us today, who's a lawyer by profession, and she's right now in Atlanta, Georgia. So she's had her own law firm at a point in time, and she still thinks she does something in law. Business architecture is what she does. And then other than that, she's uh, been an author, and she's been a big proponent of women and uh, their progress generally in life. So having said that, let's welcome Sela. Sela, welcome aboard. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. So in your own words, tell us who you are and what you do. Oh, wow. That's a lot. That's a whole mouthful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, I yes, I'm in, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia right now. I have a business architect firm, actually one of the top business architect firms um, in the southeast part of the country. Um, but before that, yes, you, you were correct that I did practice law. I don't practice law now. Now I have my business architect firm, so it's a little bit different. Um, I was a business bankruptcy and criminal uh, attorney during that time for going on a decade. Uh, prior to that, I worked for the National Organization for Women, um, the largest women's organization in the world, where we organized the March for Women's Lives, 2004 March for Women's Lives, where we had over 1.2 million people March on Washington, which was one of the largest marches in the history of the United States for its time um, during that time. So I've been in the movement for quite a bit. Um, I also, uh, during my practice in law, I was able to free, free over 300 years of black lives from prison, or, prison industrial complex. So I've been busy. I've been busy. So let's reflect back on, on your own life uh, before we get into the other things that you've done. Reflecting back on your younger years and, you know, while you were in college and all, how was that time frame? How did you shape up to be a lawyer? Hmm. So I, I started, I wanted to be a lawyer ever since I was eight years old. It, it started um, very early in my childhood. It was actually a school play. I was in the third grade and I wanted to be the lawyer really, 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 really badly in this um, school play. And for some reason, um, the teacher at the time wasn't completely sold on me being the attorney. So I really had to prove myself. But afterwards, everybody was like, oh, my God, you really need to be an attorney. Um, in real life. So since then, I, ha I had the vision that I always knew that I wanted to get into law. Um, I just didn't exactly know how. But the, the passion for it came a little further in life because um, I grew up in a community that was very disenfranchised. And I saw a lot of the people that were in my life, the people that I love, like my mother and my father and um, my community members, I saw them disenfranchised by the police. I saw them abused. I saw them not having the legal counsel that they really needed to be able to help them through the system. So I knew that I, I, I needed to become the solution. So I, I kind of I, I created a plan to become my own superhero very early in life so that I can help the people that I grew up with, so that I can help my community members. Um, so I knew that I wanted to kind of rescue my, my family and my parents. So um, that created that passion and that push um, to become an attorney later on down the line. You know, once you kind of got into becoming a lawyer, how did you find your way around what you wanted to do? I know you've been in business and bankruptcy to begin with. So... Can, can you reframe, reframe that question a little bit so that I can make sure I understand it correctly? Yeah, absolutely. So I was just trying to figure out, you know, you, you wanted to become a lawyer. You became one. How did you end up being a business lawyer or a bankruptcy lawyer, so to speak? Wow. So, hmm. well, I, I did business bankruptcy and criminal law. So in the beginning, I actually... Um, was was interested in getting into the um, the criminal aspect. Uh, my undergraduate was in criminal justice, so and and that was because of, of of the community that I grew up in that I wanted to get into criminal law. Uh, but at the time, I started uh, getting some opportunities in business and bankruptcy. I worked for initially a large law firm, um, Baker and Hostetler, which was one of the largest law firms in the area. And I did more business and transactional work during that time. So it gave me a, a niche um, that I didn't initially anticipate. And eventually, um, I eventually started uh, I started my own law firm with that niche. I also worked for a small boutique firm at the time, um, Romney Law Office. So after that, I realized that there was a niche that I could pick up on. And I really had a, a passion for, for, for businesses and entrepreneurship. And that's really kind of how I got into the business and, and, and bankruptcy aspect. So when you talk about business architecture and your business architecture firm right now, what exactly is that? Okay. So business architecture, a lot of people get it confused because there's a lot of business coaches um, and business consultants out here. So just to give you a little bit of um, 
insight. So a, a business consultant will tell you, will say, hey, these are my recommendations for what you need to do in your business, right? A business coach is somebody that will try to pull the answers out of you. So they try to um, get you to come up with your own conclusions about what you need to happen in your business and, and then you, you solve those yourself. So a business architect is somebody that's going to kind of work um, as, as a co-CEO or co-CFO with you. So they're in the trenches with you. Um, so while you're pushing, they're pulling and vice versa. So we're actually working together um, in your company. A lot of uh, small businesses, they don't really realize, um, you know, the importance of having a CEO, a CFO, a COO in your business. So what we do is we go in and we co-CEO, co-CFO, co-COO with you, and we create your business infrastructure. A lot of times entrepreneurs are just winging it. And when you're winging it, um, a lot of times you're reinventing the wheel. So we build the infrastructure from the time that you walk into your office, you know, cut on the light, have your employees sit at the, at the computer, um, make contact with your clients to the point that they get to human resources, fulfillment, customer service, um, sales, marketing. Uh, we build that infrastructure for you so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel, so that you have a proven system um, that's automated, um, that's customized to your business, and, and that puts you in a position where you're not always trading work for time. Um, so we're, we're, we're constantly making sure that we're creating improvements to your systems. That's the first thing that a business architect should do. Uh, what makes my firm a little bit different than most inter, uh, business architect firms is that um, in addition to building that infrastructure, so we build the infrastructure for you first, but in addition to building that infrastructure, we generally work with clients um, that are exceptional. They're outside of the norm. They're thought leaders, right? So they're not just lawyers. You know, they're the Johnny Cochran's of law, or they may be the Susie Orman's of financial advising, or um, potentially like the, the Dr. Phil of medicine, right? So they're thought leaders in the industry. And if people are not familiar with that term, a lot of people call themselves experts, right? Um, but the difference between an expert and a thought leader is that an expert will tell you how to do something. So they'll tell you, okay, you need to do A, B, and C, and then D will result. But a thought leader will give you insight on how to think differently about their particular expertise. So we're not just building entrepreneurs um, or CEOs. We're building thought leaders that are in the industry. Um, in addition to the fact that most of our, um, most of our clients are also um, scholars, right? Um, in this day and age, you can't just be a um, an expert in the industry anymore. Um, if you're in a service-based industry where you have to touch people, you know, now, especially since coronavirus, you just can't touch them, right? You have to have a way that they get to you uh, remotely and online. Because people have the ability to look all over the world for your competitors, now you can't just be an expert in the industry. They want to know that you're the teacher of the experts, that you are the mentors and the leaders of the experts. So we make um, we, we make the world know that our clients are scholars in the industry so that um, they can create that authority. So in addition to making sure that the infrastructure work, uh, we put them on the academic circuit so that they are keynoting um, at colleges and universities across, around the country. We also make sure that they are recognized in media sources around the country as thought leaders in the industry, as scholars in the industry, um, and that they have uh, premium products and services that are backed by by journals. So um, that's a little bit of information about how our company works. What, what is your firm called right now? It's Ninava and Associates. N I N A V A um, Ninava and Associates. So the the website actually is www.ninavafirm.com. N I N A V A F I R M dot com. And you're also a big supporter of Black Lives Matter and women empowerment. So can you talk a little bit about some of your work in those realms? Absolutely. So like I told you before, we initially, um, we I started off in, in, in activism in the movement with the National Organization for Women, um, the largest women's organization in the world. Um, if, if anybody knows me, my story is not like the average entrepreneur story or the average um, lawyer story because my it, it didn't really start out all biscuits and gravy. I started off when I was, you know, 11 years old, 12 years old um, as a sex worker. And I was a child sex worker from the ages of 12 to roughly about 19 years old. And a lot of people don't necessarily understand what that means. When I say sex worker, they think, um, you know, what, what, what exactly are you talking about? So a sex worker is basically um, a politically correct term for somebody that exchanged money for sex. 
Um, so I, I started out in the sex work industry and the, the kind of a turning factor in my life when I was younger um, to, that pulled me out of that industry was really the National Organization for Women. So I started working for the National Organization for Women as pretty much a, um, the national field director for women of color. So I organized women around the country around women's rights. So basically I was um, a professional troublemaker is, is what we call it. So I would go around organizing protests demonstrations, civil disobedience around women's rights around the country. Um, and then from there, um, after I worked for the National Organization for Women is when I started practicing law. Um, and during that time, while, while handling criminal cases, I, I was you know privileged and honored to be able to help over 300 years of Black lives be freed from the criminal industrial complex uh, through representing them um, in cases where you know a lot of times many Black people were being disenfranchised and didn't have adequate representation. Um, so um, I'm definitely very um, happy with that work right now. Um, I'm still with the National Organization for Women in Georgia, Georgia now, and we are um, doing a lot of work around both women's rights and uh, people of color rights. Uh, we did a lot of work on this election here and, and the work is not done right now. We're in the process of organizing um, the work around the protect black women um, stance in, in Georgia. So we, we anticipate that we're going to be organizing a Protect Black Women March here very soon as well. There's also the talk about uh, notoriety, right? Uh, being a notorious attorney and then your TEDx talk. So let's talk about that. Why that uh, Why that brand of notoriety? <laughs> uh, yeah, that was definitely a brand of notorious. Um, notorious. I, I made a lot of judges mad, made a lot of prosecutors mad. I, you know, I, and I've been kicked out of every single... Um, club that I've been in, every single group that I've been in, because I've always been the, um, the in your face person. I've always been very vocal, um, about what I believed in. I've always been the person that, you know, we held in contempt of court, um, that we get kicked out of courtrooms, that judges would fuss out. You know, we were always going back and forth, um, because I really believed in what I did. And we took a lot of, um, we took a lot of chances to make sure that people of color, um, and people that were disenfranchised in general were protected and that their rights were being handled. For example, I had this one particular case. Well, actually, this was one of my partner's cases um, that she was working on um, with the firm where um, a woman um, said that she had been robbed by a young black man. And keep in mind, this is in um, in Colorado at the time. So there's, you know, the, the population of black people in general are is less than less than 11 percent in Colorado. So there's not a lot of black people around. So she indicated that she had been robbed by a young black man that he came up. And I can't remember when he grabbed a purse or he grabbed a phone. I can't remember which one it was. But she indicated that he grabbed her uh, her phone or her purse and then ran off. Right. And she I didn't she ended up identifying our client um, in this particular case. So in this particular case, we knew we absolutely knew that this was not our client that actually did this particular incident and that she was just profiling. Um, but in, you know, in, in a courtroom, a lot of times you, the, the law doesn't always provide so that we can actually prove what's true, right? The law is really there to just kind of navigate the system and not necessarily to, to fight for truth. So we had to figure out a way to let this jury know that this particular woman didn't know who robbed her. Um, it's unfortunately that she did, she did get robbed, but it wasn't our client. Um, so what um, my, my partner did at the time is that she put another defendant at the table where, where, where we were um, representing our client at. So, of course, um, when the prosecutor was um, doing an a, a, um, examination on his client, when he was asking her questions, he asked her to, to point out the person that robbed her. Her, not necessarily, not even really knowing the person that robbed her, only knowing that it was a black man, of course, she... Uh, pointed out the person that was at the defense table with us. The prosecution really didn't even know who robbed her. That's how much profiling it was at this time. Keep in mind, we're in Colorado, right? So she pointed out the person that was at the table. My partner, she was very grandiose. She loved to kind of make a scene. We were very, we were two black attorneys in Colorado. Now, you, I told you earlier that the population of black people in Colorado was about 11%. Black attorneys was even more scarce. Um, I believe at the time when we were practicing, there were probably 300 uh, black attorneys in the entire state. So there wasn't very much of us, right? So, and black women, <laughs> even fewer, right? There was probably a handful of black women attorneys in Colorado. But we happened to be two black women attorneys at the time that was very um, outspoken, very um, extravagant, very big in our presentation. 
So, of course, my partner at the time, you know, when, once she saw that the uh, alleged victim in the case uh, didn't know who robbed her and that she identified the wrong person, she gets up and she says, see, you know, to the jury, this proves that she's racially profiling our client. This is not the person that's the defendant today at the table. The person that's the defendant is actually in the audience, but she still pointed out the person at the table. This is an example. This is proof that she's racially profiled. Now, of course, the good news about this particular case is that the jury ended up finding the client not guilty um, on all counts, right? But the judge was very upset, very mad, and didn't like it at all uh, because the law doesn't necessarily always provide for the truth. Like I said, it provides for people to be navigated to the system, which is completely different. So, um, of course, it was fines. You know, the judge fussed, you know, fussed her out, you know, um, held her in contempt of court, fined her, fined her. And, um, you know, it, it was definitely a, a journey um, that she had to take just as a result of this particular case. Um, so it was all types of examples, you know, with clients that we represented where we had to take, you know, interesting or extreme measures to be able to prove their innocence. Um, but it was definitely a journey. It was a, definitely a journey in the process. As far as Ninawa is concerned, what are some of the services you provide? Um, so like I told you before, um, the first thing that we do is we go in and we do an audit and we build the infrastructure of your company. So we have to examine your company to figure out what it is that you do best. And we go through um, all of the nooks and crannies to figure out where your leaky holes are, where your, where's your leaky faucet, where are there holes in the bucket that we can go in and fix so that we can focus on your profit pockets um, the most. So that's the first thing that we do. Um, and then we build the infrastructure. There's 10 pillars of a business. So we go through each of those 10 pillars um, so that we can make sure that your infrastructure is tight. Um, we teach the principles and implement the principles of automation delegation and elimination so that we can make sure that your company is, is is running smoothly. One of the things that we say often in our in our company is that, you know, we take entrepreneurs from hustle to enterprise level. So we build systems in your company so that you can um, build your company up to a Fortune 500 or an enterprise level. Um, so that's the first thing we do. The second thing that we do, like I said pre previously, um, is that we work with thought leaders in the industry. Um, and scholars in the industry. So in addition to making sure that the infrastructure work, um, we also make sure that our, our clients are seen and recognized as scholars and thought leaders in the industry. So one of the things that we do um, in reference to that is that we take um, our, our, our speakers and clients on an international speaking tour around colleges and universities around the country, over 900 colleges and universities around the country. Um, and many of them are, are Ivy League colleges and universities. So we take them, um, on a college tour and an Ivy League tour to speak, um, and talk about their thought leadership, um, as, as keynote, uh, speakers and lecturers. Um, and then the third thing that we do um, is that we make sure that our, our clients have premium products and services. One of the things that we learned in this age um, as of, of COVID-19 is that every company, even if you are a brick and mortar company or if you are a service provider, provider every company needs to have some type of digital uh, stream of income around their brand. Um, so that could be a course uh, that we physically create for them, that could be um, an app that we work for them that can be a subscription box or a subscription service that we create for them. Um, we base it um, independently on what the company's specialty is, but we make sure that we build out that digital stream of revenue. A lot of times what happens when companies are trying to build their brand and they're building up from scratch, um, kind of, you know, um, bootstrapping their company is that they end up having to play a whole lot of different roles. So they wear all of these hats. They are the bookkeeper, they're the accountant, they're the attorney, you know, their customer service, their sales, their marketing. They have to do everything in the business. They're wearing all of these different hats, which makes them feel like they're overwhelmed. They're too many, doing too many things. They can't be good at any particular one thing because they're doing so many things that they end up just being mediocre in everything. So we come in as their co-CEO, co-CFO, co-COO, um, and help them to build this infrastructure for them so that they can focus on building a business instead of working in the business. Um, so we built out these systems um, and products and services for them so that they can have the time to actually work on the business. One of the biggest things that I, I tell my, um, my, my clients is that there's this myth that everybody has the same 24 hours in a day. Right. And, you know, it makes us really question our self worth, question how good we are, question our business. Um, when, you know, everybody says, well, you got the same 24 hours a day as Beyonce. So why isn't your company as big or as grand as Beyonce? And the reality is, is that we don't, we don't have the same 24 hours a day. 
as Beyonce because Beyonce has a business manager or business architect um, that's working with her, that's delegating things to a hundred other people that makes her 24 hours a day times 100, right? So we don't have the same 24 hours a day. So some of the beginning steps for, for people that are starting their businesses or people that are at a, um, a mid-level business is, is to bring in that business manager so that they can scale efficiently and they have somebody that's working with. Now, do you also work with startups, uh, especially those with just an idea? We do. We do work with startups. They, they take a little bit more nurturing in the beginning uh, because they have a trial stage. They have a discovery stage that they have to go through. But we work with both startups and mid-level companies. Um, there's things that startups need to do in the beginning and, and a mindset that startups have to really develop in the beginning uh, that we work on more so with the startups um, because they're still trying to understand what an enterprise is. So there's a lot more training and education that we have to do when people are in the startup stage. When we're working with mid-sized companies, many times they've already had the, the education and the training and the understanding of how to run an enterprise. They just don't have the resources to run an enterprise so we can get straight into the, in, in, into the enterprising and building the infrastructure. When we're working with startups, a lot of times we have to do a lot of education in the beginning first so that they can understand what it takes to get to enterprise level and then build their infrastructure. Now, how do you source your clients or how do they find you? How do, how do my clients find me? Um, different ways. I mean, we do some marketing online, but a lot of it is referral. Like, for example, I mean, generally, um, 90% of the year we're at capacity. A lot of our clients come to us from the previous year and we can't, we can't work with clients anymore because we work with clients in, in a lot of detail. We're their co-CEO. So our team is working to build multiple businesses, um, throughout the year. So a lot of it, most of it is through referral. Um, because we, we work with people that are ready to be able to scale their companies, but we also do some online marketing as well. And how do your clients measure results? Our clients measure, measure results by profit. <laughs> profit, um, being able to um, see themselves recognized in the media um, the way that they weren't recognized before, um, seeing you know the media recognize them as a scholar in the industry. Um, getting the tours um, at the colleges and universities and conferences around the country, um, having a college and university call you up multiple times a year and say, hey, you know, um, we want to pay you to come and do a keynote at Texas University, or we want to pay you to come and do a, a, a keynote at Brown University, or we want to pay you to do a keynote at Cornell, and we have, you know, $10,000 here for you, can you come? on X, Y, and Z day. So our clients, they measure their results, first of all, in profit in their company and efficiency, how their company runs compared to, you know, when they started before we was there and where they are now, because we make sure that their, their company is running on a system now and it's not just something that they're guessing at. And then the third way is that they're seeing the results because now they're recognized as a scholar in the industry. They see the media and they're getting the speaking opportunities on the academic circuit. So what does 2021 look like after what we've been through 2020. The biggest thing that you know, I tell people right now um, that the uh, the changing of the industry is that um, is you know this this is the time for scholars only, right? This is the time for scholars only, and I do tell everybody that, you know that that I see that actually has that drive, that potential, the hustle, and the expertise that they can have next, right? Um, actually, I do. I have a program that's called for scholars only, but we're in um, a an, an age where you can't just be an expert. Like I said before, if you're in a service-based industry, you have to be the leader of the leaders. They don't want just somebody that's expert in the industry because we have so many people that are trying, that are claiming that they're experts. People that, you know, went to, um, that, that barely graduated from high school, you know, and hasn't read a book since high school, but they want you to buy their book on how to start a business, right? So now, you know, in this age, people are, are looking for proof of concept. They want to see that you're really um, the person that you say you are in. And the way that you do that is by becoming a scholar or a thought leader in your industry. A lot of times, you know, there's so much information that's going around right now. Um, a lot of people are doing coaching and consulting and starting companies, especially in this COVID-19 era where there's so many opportunities for small businesses that are available because of COVID-19. So everybody is trying to say, okay, I'm an expert in this, or I'm a coach in this, or I'm a consultant in this. So there's a plethora of information that's out there. There's so much information that people don't even know who to depend on. They don't know who they can count on. They don't know who is actually that expert and who is just saying it. So now, you know, people are looking for scholars. They don't just want 
the experts or the coaches or the consultants. They want scholars um, and they want people that have proof of concept. So that's what we do for our clients. Um, we, we, we choose particular clients that, that we know that are thought leaders and that we make sure that the world knows that they're thought leaders as well. In addition to making sure that their infrastructure is tight and strong so that they can spend, you know, 25, 30 percent of the time, you know, going on tour around the country. Because if you don't have a strong infrastructure at home, right, if your business requires you to constantly work in it, if you have to be present, it's going to be difficult for you to get on the road and go on tour, you know, to 900 colleges and universities around the country. So the first thing that we have to do is make sure that your infrastructure is tight so that your, your business still runs in your absence. And then we take you to that thought leadership platform. Well, Priscilla, it looks like you you found your niche. You found uh, the kind of business that you want to be in, starting off as a lawyer and now kind of gravitating towards actually helping businesses. And uh, we wish you the very best as you move forward. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for sharing your story, your uh, business, and then providing inspiration to so many listeners out there. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. This has been fun. And I hope anybody that wants to reach me reaches out to me. They can come to the website, ninabafarm.com. You can reach me on social media, Instagram, Salah Ward. My name is spelled a little differently. It's N-S-E-L-A-A-W-A-R-D. The N is silent. Um, you can reach me at Salah Ward on Instagram or on Facebook. Um, or, you know, you can, you know, just message me anytime. I definitely respond. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Hey, I hope you liked that episode. Please do check out Plan B Success Podcast on your favorite listing platforms. It's also available on www.planb.live. If you're looking to learn how to podcast and learn everything there is to ideate, create, launch, and monetize a podcast, do get in touch through the website www.planb.live. And I'll be more than happy to help. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.